Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to the Gaming Rules official how to play video for Luna, designed by Stefan Feld and published by Taste of Mineral Games, who commissioned me to create this instructional video. The Moon Priestess's regency is coming to an end, and it's time to choose a new bearer of the title Luna. You and up to three other players are the heads of an order trying to prove yourself worthy to become her successor. Over the course of six rounds, you'll be trying to gain as many influence points as possible by skillfully using your novices. You will move them around the seven holy aisles that surround the temple and perform various tasks, such as constructing shrines, recruiting additional novices or gaining favour. You will promote your novices onto the central island and then sanctify them into the temple itself, where they will work diligently, generating influence. You can gain additional points by working on the island with the Moon Priestess herself, but you will also lose points if you are near the apostate. At the end of the game, the player with the most influence points wins. This video has been created using the original version of the game, but Taste of Minstrel are bringing the game to Kickstarter and deluxifying it. So for more details of what the new version of the game will look like, then please check out the Kickstarter page, which I'll link in the show notes below. For your first game, it's highly recommended to use a fixed setup, which I'll be explaining during these setup instructions. This is because you must make certain choices during the setup of the game, and you kind of need to know how to play the game in order to make those good choices. Once you know how to play the game, you can use the standard setup rules. Each player chooses a colour of pieces, takes an overview sheet, and starts with five influence points. One player is chosen at random to be the starting player, and they get the start player marker. Then, assemble the temple or island by attaching the pieces of the frame together. Take the four temple boards and randomly choose one per player in the game. I'm going to be setting up a three player game, so I'm going to choose these three. Place the chosen boards face up within the frame, nearest the temple gate. And place the remaining temple boards face down in the vacant spaces. Take the temple tiles and remove from the game all of those that do not match one of the colours on the temple boards in use. Randomly distribute the tiles numbered 1 to 4 that are still in the game among the players. Each player places the received tile on the appropriate space in the temple that matches the number of the tile, together with a Book of Wisdom and then a novice in that player's chosen colour. Place the lowest numbered guard tile, one of the twos, next to the temple gate. And then starting with the highest numbered temple tile, place a number of temple tiles in descending numeric order equal to the number of players in the game, and place them along the path. Then, keep placing the next highest guard tile and another set of descending temple tiles until all guard and temple tiles have been placed along the path. Place the guard of the temple figure on the guard tile of value 6. Starting with the token with the 1 on it, stack the 4 time tokens in the meditation room with the burning candle side face up. If you're playing a 2 player game, remove the time token on top of the stack. Beginning with the start player and going clockwise, players stack their member of the council piece on the first space of the council of priests, so the starting player's piece is on the bottom of this stack. Place the influence tokens in the observatory. Place the seven holy aisles around the temple island. For your first game, use the side of the holy aisles with the number on it and place them in numerical order clockwise around the temple. In later games, just shuffle the aisles and place them randomly using the non-numbered side. On each aisle, place a number of the appropriate favour tokens equal to the number of players in the game. Take the proper Moon Priestess figure according to the number of players, and then for your first game, place the Moon Priestess on Holy Isle number 1, as indicated by the artwork. Place the Master Builder on Isle 7, and the Apostate on Isle 5. In later games, distribute each of the figures on the Holy Isles of your choice, and you may place more than one figure on the same aisle. The final step of setup is for each player to place their starting eight novices and a shrine onto the aisles. For your first game, the artwork on the aisles tells you where to place them. For example, all players will place two novices on aisle one, and red will place a shrine on aisle five. In later games, beginning with the start player and continuing clockwise, each player will place one of their shrines on a holy aisle of their choice, and players must choose different aisles. No aisle may contain more than one shrine at the beginning of the game. And in the two-player game, neither player may choose the Herbal Isle for their starting shrine. Next, beginning with the start player, players will take turns to place two novices onto one of the aisles. And this process repeats until all players have placed four sets of novices, so eight in total. And the only restriction here is that you cannot place pieces on an aisle already containing your pieces, including your shrine. But you can place novices on aisles containing other players' pieces. 
And finally, whether this is your first game or not, each player will receive one favour token from each of the two aisles that they do not have any pieces on. So here, if you are the red player, then you start with one shrine favour token and one bribery favour token, as you have no pieces on those islands at the start of the game. And with setup complete, you're now ready to play the game. The game is divided into six rounds. In each round, players will take turns in clockwise order, beginning with the starting player. On your turn, you can perform one of the 14 different actions summarised on the player aid. One of the actions you can choose to do is to meditate, which flips over the top time token from the stack. And when the final time token is flipped over, the round ends immediately. There is then a scoring phase where players will receive points for novices in the temple and also for being on the aisle with the moon priestess, but they will lose points for being on or near the aisle with the apostate. And you then prepare for the next round by returning novices to their aisles, restacking the time tokens and moving the four figures. After six rounds, additional influence is scored for certain things and then the game ends and the player with the most influence points wins. As mentioned in the game overview, on your turn you perform one action and then play passes to the next player. The actions are all summarised on the player aid and the sheer thought of there being 14 different actions you can do might seem overwhelming at first, but I'll try to go through each one of them one by one and explain how they work. An action may affect one or more novices and or consume a favour token. Unless otherwise stated, you can only take actions with your own active novices, i.e. the ones on the Holy Isles. And after taking an action that involves novices, you place the used novices next to the Holy Isle and they are now considered inactive. The actions are grouped by type and I'm going to explain the four Isle actions first. The Priest's Favour action allows you to use two novices on one Holy Isle to gain the favour token of that Isle. The favour tokens all do different things, which I'll be explaining as I cover the other actions. And note, you can only have one of each favour token. If you own a shrine on the Isle where you are taking this action, you only need to use a single novice to gain a favour token. This is represented by the iconography here. Two novices needed normally, but only one if you have a shrine. The Recruit action allows you to use two novices from one Holy Isle to add another novice into the game. This always uses two novices, even when you have a shrine there. The new novice starts off inactive, at the same Isle as where the Recruit action took place. Having more novices in the game will allow you to perform more actions on later rounds, but you're having to give up your valuable actions this round in order to do so. The Shrine action allows you to construct a shrine, but only at the Isle where the Master Builder is currently present. To build a shrine, return a Shrine Favour token and use two novices on the Holy Isle with the Master Builder. Shrines have several benefits. As mentioned earlier, the Priest's Favour action only uses one novice instead of two on an Isle with your Shrine. And the same benefit applies to the Promotion action which I'll be explaining later. Shrines also count during the scoring of the Moon Priestess and each one of them is worth four influence points at the end of the game. So, there are many reasons for building a shrine, but you need to have the Shrine Favour token and two novices on the aisle with the Master Builder, so you need to plan accordingly to have everything in place at the right time. And each player can only have one shrine on each aisle, but there may be any number of shrines from different players on that aisle. The Herbs action allows you to spend a Herbal Favour token to reactivate one or two inactive novices on one Holy Isle, potentially allowing you to use them again this round. The only exception to this is that you cannot use this action on the Herb Isle itself. The three different movement actions are just different ways for you to move your novices around the aisles. The Journey action is the cheapest but weakest action and it allows you to move any number of your active novices from any number of aisles and place them next to any other aisles. These novices that you move are now inactive and so you cannot do anything else with them this round unless you reactivate them using the herbs as mentioned earlier. You would use this action to move your novices in position ready for the next round. The Tide action requires you to spend a Tide Favour token back to the appropriate aisle. It's similar to the Journey action in that you can take any number of novices from any number of aisles and place them next to any number of aisles, but you can also move inactive novices, i.e. ones that you've already used for an action this round, getting them into position ready for the next round. The Sailboat action is the most powerful movement action, but it requires you to spend a Sailboat Favour token. You can then move one or two novices from one Holy Isle to any other Holy Isle, 
but the novices remain active so that you can use them again for something this round. A quick side note about the landing stage on the Temple Island. During the game, players can end up with novices here, and to get them from here, you need to use either the tide action or the sailboat action as depicted here. So, when you're using the tide action, remember you can move any number of novices from anywhere, you can also take them from the landing. And when you're using the sailboat action, you can move one or two novices from the landing stage instead of taking them from another holy isle. The four temple actions are all about, yes you guessed it, the central temple island. And the first two of these actions are the most complex ones in the game, so I'll try to go over them in a bit more detail. First, the promotion action allows you to move a novice from a holy isle onto a temple tile on the path around the temple. If you do not have a shrine on the isle, this requires two novices. One becomes inactive and the other gets promoted. The temple tile that you can claim must have the same symbol as the isle where the novice was promoted from. So here, if you're promoting from this isle with the tide favours, you can only claim a temple tile with a tide image. And you can only claim a tile which is between the landing stage and the current position of the guard figure. So in this case, you can claim this one. If you own a shrine on the isle in question, you don't need the second novice. You simply promote one of them from the isle onto a temple tile. If you have a bribery favour token, you can spend it when promoting to claim a tile which is a part of the next set of tiles beyond the guard figure i.e. these ones here. So, just to recap, if you don't bribe the guard, you can only claim a tile leading up to the guard figure. But if you bribe the guard, you can claim a tile beyond the guard figure, but only up to the next guard tile. And what does claiming a temple tile do? Well, on its own, nothing at all. But now it's time to explain the sanctification action. This action allows you to move a claimed temple tile into the temple itself, along with the novice on it. If the tile you are moving is beyond the guard figure, you must spend a bribery favour token to take this action on that tile. Which means, if you're planning to promote and sanctify on a tile beyond the guard figure in the same round, you will need to use two bribery favours. And remember, you can only ever have one of each favour at any time. Whether you bribe the guard or not, you gain a number of influence points equal to the printed number on the guard tile where the guard figure stands which is 6 at the start of the game, but this number decreases as the game goes on. You then place the temple tile, along with the novice on it, on the matching space in the temple. If there are any novices on adjacent spaces, you need to check to see if they get displaced. First, you only displace novices from other players, your own ones are safe. Second, you only displace novices on tiles with a lower number than the one that you placed. And third, a novice is protected if it has a Book of Wisdom. For example, in this case, only the white novice here is displaced. Displaced novices are placed on the landing stage of the Temple Island. And remember, you can pick up your displaced novices when using the sailboat or tide actions. When you place a tile into the temple, you gain one influence point for each novice that you displaced. The book action requires you to spend a Book of Wisdom favour token to move a Book of Wisdom in the temple from under another player's novice and place it underneath one of your own novices that currently doesn't have a book. This gains you one influence point, but more importantly your novice is now protected from displacement when other people sanctify their novices into the temple. In the two player game, the first player to use a book token in each round scores two influence points instead of one. The Council of Priests action is a very simple action. Use any number of novices on any one aisle, and then move your member of the council piece up a number of seats equal to the number of novices that you used. If you move to a space with another player's piece, you place your disc on top. Unless this is the last seat in the council, in this case you place your disc on the bottom of the stack. The order of the markers in the Council of Priests is used to determine tie breaks in the end of round scoring, and you'll also score extra points at the end of the game the further your marker is moved. The final three actions are as follows. Expulsion allows you to move the apostate to another holy isle. You can use any number of novices on the holy isle with the apostate to move him that number of isles clockwise. The reason you want to move the apostate is that because during scoring, all players will lose points for novices on or next to the isle with the apostate. So moving him away from your isle will stop you losing points, and if you move them to an isle where the other players have novices, then they will lose points instead. Of course, there's nothing to stop one of those players taking the same action and moving the apostate even further. 
The virtual novice action is a tricky one, as it's not actually an action in itself, but it's something that you can do when taking another action. If you have a novice favour token when taking another action that requires you to use novices, then you can spend the token to gain one extra virtual novice for that action. For example, if you wanted to expel the apostate two spaces but only had one novice on the island, you could use that novice and a novice favour token to move the apostate two spaces. Or, if you were wanting to promote a novice from this isle here, this normally requires two novices if you don't have a shrine, but you could use one novice and a novice favour token as the second one. There's a couple of exceptions to using this token. One is fairly obvious is that you cannot promote a virtual novice onto a temple tile. That has to be a real novice. And also, you cannot use a virtual novice to gain a novice favour token, which is actually a very bad idea anyway, but you're not allowed to do it. The final action to explain is meditation, and this is also very simple, but very important. To meditate, you simply flip over the top time token from the stack and place it here. Very importantly, this does not mean that you are out of the round, it's just an action which you can take, and when it's your turn again, you can resume taking other actions, or you could meditate again. The player who turns over the last time token scores one influence point, and the round ends immediately. Nobody else gets to perform any other actions. And this is something that you need to be very careful about in the game. You might have lots of novices and have a whole round planned with lots of things that you want to do, but if another player only has a few novices, maybe because they have a number of them in the temple, then they'll be likely to be meditating early, causing the round to end before you got to do everything that you wanted to do. The player to the left of the player who turned over the last tile receives the start player marker and will go first in the next round. The two-player game is an exception to this. The start player marker is always passed to the other player at the end of a round, no matter who turned over the last time token. In the scoring phase, each player receives or loses influence points in three different ways. First, on the aisle with the Moon Priestess, count the number of active novices and shrines of each player. Inactive novices do not count. The player with the highest number of pieces, in this case yellow with two, gains influence points equal to the large printed number on the Moon Priestess figure, which is five in a three-player game. Second place, in this case red, gains a number of points equal to the smaller number, which is two. If red had no active novices, then nobody would score the second place points. If two or more players are tied on the number of pieces they have, the player who is ahead in the Council of Priests wins the tie. And if the markers are on the same space, then the one that's on top of the stack is ahead. In a four-player game, you'll be using this Priestess figure, which is six points for the player with the most active pieces, three points for second place, and one point for third place. In this situation, blue and red tie for the most number of pieces on the island, but red is just ahead in the Council of Priests, so red scores six points and blue scores three. No other players are on the aisle, so nobody scores the third place. On the aisle with the apostate, count the number of active and inactive novices of each player. Shrines here do not matter, because inanimate objects are immune to the ramblings of the apostate. Each player now loses a number of influence points equal to the number of novices they have there, plus one. So here, red has two novices on and near the island, and therefore loses three points. And white loses two points. If you do not have any novices on or near the Isle with the Apostate, then you do not lose any points. Finally, the Temple. Each player gains one influence point for each of their novices in the Temple. So the earlier you get novices into the Temple, the better, as they will continue to score you points. But that means you have less novices for other actions. And of course, novices placed in the Temple early on will be on the lower numbers, meaning that eventually they will get displaced. So this is something that you need to consider. On the last round, you can skip this part and proceed to final scoring. Otherwise, a few steps need to be performed before continuing the game. All inactive novices are placed back on the aisles that they are next to. They are now active again. The Moon Priestess figure is moved clockwise to another aisle. She moves a number of aisles equal to the large printed number, so five spaces in a three-player game. The Master Builder also moves clockwise to another aisle following the same rules, and he always moves four spaces. The apostate moves clockwise to the next aisle that contains at least one novice. And the guard of the temple moves to the next guard tile on the path. And then you remove from the game the guard tile that he just left. Restack the time tokens in the same manner as during setup. The game ends at the end of the sixth round. 
Each player gains additional influence as follows. Each shrine that you've constructed is worth 4 influence points, and each unused favour token is worth 1 influence point. And then the position of your marker in the Council of Priests also shows how many extra points you get. The player with the most influence points wins the game, and their order will provide the next Moon Priestess. Ties are resolved according to the position of the markers in the Council of Priests as mentioned earlier. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Luna in the domain of the Moon Priestess. For more of my videos, please consider subscribing to my channel, and if you have any questions about the game at all, please leave them in the comments below. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching. Gaming Rules is proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com